Well, I can pray. You did it last time. That's right. Cool. That way we can maintain rotation. Okay. We good? Good. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to be able to come together once again, Lord, in your name, for your amazing love and grace and mercy over our lives, for this freedom that we have to be able to study and grow and learn more about you, Lord. We pray that we can be edified by this book, Lord, that the people watching these videos as well can be edified along with us, that we can all grow together as brothers in Christ, as one body of believers, that we can raise the bar and set the standard and set a new a new goal for what it means to be a godly man in this day and this age. Lord, we thank you for your love and your mercy over us every day. We pray that you be with us tonight in everything that we say and do. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so what did you guys think of this chapter? I think it was good. I think it addressed some very critical things. Mm -hmm. It addressed some very very critical things in uh, in every man's life especially the topic of um, like watching your eyes right yeah because like uh, like the Lord said the eyes are the window of the body right if your eye is good then your whole body will be filled with light if your eye is bad then the light that is within you is darkness so if we keep letting darkness within and corrupting our eyes then there will only be darkness inside of us yeah, I really like this one, like, um, particularly, you know, how it relates to talking about David, like, that's, that's one thing a lot of people kind to, they take the, a little bit of it, right, like, looking at Bathsheba, and then that's really kind of the end of it, right, that they don't go into depth, but if you really study it, like, that is the turning point in David's life, like, after that incident, everything to his death, like, is just down it. It is a door that that cannot be closed once it's been opened, and it's it's very good uh, reminder, you know, that you know if you decide to go down that path in your life of that temptation and giving in and, and not shutting that out right away, and and to, to rewind even a little bit further, you know, to be complacent and get in, in a place of, of comfort in your life where you can just say. I don't need to worry about this, it's never gonna happen to me. And the next thing you know, everything is going downhill because you slipped up, right? It's it's a very slippery slope. And I'm, I'm glad that this book touched on it because that's it's a good way of putting things into perspective for sure. Briefly, like I like how they they show breakdown as well. Uh, between page 37 and 38 for David, you know, how breaking one commandment inevitably leads to breaking like various others if not all of the others right because they're all so intertwined with the concept of purity and what it means to be holy that basically once you break one you've broken them all it was, it was neat how they showed that how how you like going through each of like like all of his actions and how this one broke the tenth yeah. this commandment which in turn bro and then he did this, which in turn broke this commandment. And mm -hmm. then he did this, which in turn, and, and then essentially he was saying, he essentially broke every commandment because the fir the last five aren't to do with loving your neighbor. And the first five are supposed to do with loving God. Yeah. And then by dishonoring, by dis breaking the first five, he dishonored God, which broke the first four. Yeah. Well, that's why you hear so much like uh, sexual immor immorality just leads to destruction. That's kind of where it stems from in my opinion the, like the way they laid it out it just I don't know amplified that phrase in my mind yeah I've noticed that uh, Mr. Hughes uses some pretty intense language in his book some language that I was like I was like that's kind of harsh that's kind of harsh but it's it's the thing is the truth is harsh yeah it is there's a nice way to, to talk about stuff like that but I don't know I think it's needed for today everybody's so soft today it's it's ridiculous um, like I liked how he started, literally started the chapter by calling it oppressive sensuality. Like he's he's completely right. You turn on the TV for five minutes. I mean, now it's not necessarily turning on a TV. It's turning on Netflix, Instagram, Facebook, whatever it is. Within f probably 25 seconds, there's going to be something sexual. Yeah, there'll be an ad. 
or somebody's post. Yeah, it or, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what it is. Especially all the TV shows that they're pumping out today. There's always some kind of sensuality behind it, some kind of and sexual. The, yeah, and it's like they're fixated on it because they can't. It seems like they can't create a TV show without the first 15 minutes of episode one of any show that's coming out now has at least five or six sex scenes. Well, that's how they, you know, that's what the world wants, so that's how they get them, right? They hook them in with that and brings the views. Yeah. I mean, I've literally canceled majority of my subscriptions because I just got sick of it. I was like, this is ridiculous. Like, this doesn't need to... Like, I was watching The Witcher. I has, I stopped watching it. I was like, this is stupid. This doesn't need to be in here. Yeah, I watched the second season of that, and I was like, you know what? And then I heard the third one was coming, I was like, I'm, t- I'm, not, I, yeah. I'm not interested. It's just too much, right? It's, it's, before when we were kids, it was different, and now it's just like over the top all the time. If it's not over the top, it's not enough. Yeah. Right. And it, it's different too, you know, having, having the perspective of being a father, like, you know, what, what you would watch with your kids around or whatnot, right? Like, it really amplifies that effect. So things, you put something on that to you or your wife it might seem mundane and but then you're like this is scary for the kids or this isn't appropriate for them and then you you amplify that and think how often does god say that about things that we deem are fine you know like your kid might say to you oh i can watch this i'm not scared blah 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 blah." but you know it's not good for them and we do the exact same thing with god where he's very clearly drawing the lines that are laid out in this chapter for what we should and should not do and you know the bible says everything's permitted but not everything is beneficial but a lot of this stuff is 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 destructive it it bears down on you it chips away at your soul at your morals little by little and it's it's not like compromise happens in one moment it's a series of small choices right and it's the same thing in this scenario where you justify a little bit here justify a little bit there and the next thing you know you know well that's part of the rationalization right yeah yeah that's part of the rationalization that he talked about in the chapter mm-hmm. it's like you know you shouldn't but then you just start going through all the rationalization trying to justify it and then you end up doing it anyway and, and then, then you, you get feel the, bad about it and then you get the consequences yeah yeah but I did like that he didn't just put the, I guess, the do's and, well, <clears throat> the don'ts, I guess I should say. Like, he didn't just put the don'ts of everything. But he did put God's will, and he did include First Thessalonians 4, uh, verses 3 to 8. Which, when I read, I don't know why, but it just, like, hit me like a truck when I read it. I was like, oof, I needed that one. <laughs> Three. <laughs> Um, in, in relation to uh, page 42 at the top where he was talking about um, throwing out stuff throwing out like he's like if your TV causes you to sin throw it out right the way that Jesus was saying if your, if your eye causes you to sin throw it away like pluck it out and throw it away I think that's personally I think it's kind of it's overkill but at the same time I also think that if you want to, to do something that you shouldn't do regardless of whether you throw away your tv or your phone or cancel your subscriptions you're going to find a way to do it anyway that's what i think well i i i agree and i disagree i mean that that's the point of discipline right so there may be a time where where you will find a way to do it anyways but definitely cutting out easy access is a huge thing like you know i'm to put it in more everyday terms i'm a huge snacker Right, that's a, a bad thing, bad habit I have. So what do I do? I just don't buy snacks. So when I get hungry for junk food, there's nothing there to eat, and so I just move on. You know, it's, the temptation isn't there. Whereas I know if there's chips or if there's cookies or something at home, I'm eating them. So <laughs> it, it might seem drastic because we put more value in those items, like a TV or a phone. But the principle behind it. I believe is totally valid where if the source of the temptation isn't there it's going to be a lot easier to fight the temptation when it comes I think it's going to vary case to case like if there's people who like they know for sure like 
oh, I can't, I'm not strong enough to do it on my own. I know I'm just going to go on my phone. I know I'm just going to go on TV. I know I'm just going to do it. Then maybe for them, yeah, the option is getting rid of it. Maybe the option is canceling their internet if they can, if they don't have to work off of it. But, I mean, if they, if they say they can't get rid of the internet, then I guess the only options would be just like the book outlines. You have to go into accountability, find somebody to talk to, go into prayer, and then try to discipline the mind. Yeah. And there's, it, it depends on where your heart is too, because there's ways around it. If you struggle with things, like particularly the internet, it's not plausible for most people. To, if you put your computer somewhere public where anyone, you know, in your household can see it at any time, things like that, right? It's there, there's always a way. You know, if you're actively seeking to be better or to be accountable or to not fall into temptation, there there will be ways. There will be ways out. What did you say it was, Austin? First Thessalonians four. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and then verses 3 to 8. I can read it if you want. I have it here. But yeah, I mean, go ahead for the viewers. Do yeah. it for the viewers. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of or defraud his brother, in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified, for God did not call us to uncleanliness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has given us the Holy Spirit. And yeah, when I read that one, I like got hit by a truck. I was like, oof. <laughs> That was very much a, a, a remote word when I read it. I was like, ooh. <laughs> it was good. <laughs> it was a good realization. Much, but. much needed. And uh, there was one more on page 42 where uh, the one that where he had it labeled as uh, boundaries. Mm -hmm. I just thought that that was like, like the boundaries that as a man you set between your wife, like this is my wife and these are my coworkers. These are the girls that I know. Yep. There's boundaries set. I just thought that the, 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 um, Examples that he gave were very was like was very good. Mm -hmm. Like if you're gonna go somewhere where like you and just another girl who isn't your wife or your girlfriend or whatever, then you should invite a third party, a third person, yeah. even if it's awkward, even if it's like you know, just just for the sake of, make sure that there isn't you're not giving yourself that chance to slip into that kind of temptation and to do those kinds of things. Yeah, it was also good where I kind of talked about like don't. Um, like don't do any flirting like even if it's casual or joking because i mean you shouldn't do that anyway but uh, just keeping it like if you have to talk to them for work just keep it about work and then kind of like nothing else essentially and then if they they might see you as as uh cold or what was the word he said shut off look for it. cold and distant yeah cold yeah. and distant i think that was it yeah, distant and cold. Yeah. Yeah, which I mean is fine because they're they're your coworkers. You're not you don't go to work to make friends. True, but having friends at work is helpful. It makes things a little easier. It makes the time go by faster. But I mean, in my job, I have to work with female coworkers, and we are spent at a, at a place together for a long period of time. It does help if, to talk. And I mean, like, I'm not getting, like, deep and intimate with lots of details, but I mean, like, oh, you know, this weekend I'm going to go visit my mom. Mm -hmm. This weekend uh, I'm going to whatever, and how was your weekend? And Yeah, just casual but, conversation. Yeah, just casual, lighthearted conversation, as long as it doesn't go, like, deeper. Yeah. You just keep, like he was saying, like, don't give, don't, they're not a shoulder to cry on. Mm -hmm. They keep your intimate conversations with intimate people. Yeah, I think that whole paragraph, the way that he had it laid out, it was it was a pretty good foundation, to be honest. Like, I like the way that he worded anything. Like, that whole whole paragraph, I didn't really have any disagreements with no, it. No, I thought it was pretty good. Although, I wouldn't find... I don't think I would often find myself in a position where it's just me and my female co-worker going on a business trip, since I don't go on business trips, but <clears throat> that's just me. I work from home. <laughs> Lucky guy. I don't have to rub it in, Austin. The business trip is going to the store. <laughs> it's the snack time. <laughs> and the last one I have was uh, on page 44, 
where it was um, the recap where he was asking like uh, the, the food for thought. Mm-hmm. Um, the question was like Satan doesn't feel so hatefulness for God, but forgetfulness of God. And what do you think? Do you agree? Do you disagree? And um, I agree. I would agree. Yeah, I would. In that moment, I be- I believe that he 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 wants you to send. You, yeah, like forget God. Just focus mm-hmm. on what you what you want right you're not, when you're sinning you're not like oh yeah. yeah god loves me as you sin you're, yeah, you know. you're just not even in your brain yeah, god is god is not in your <laughs> peripheral vision yeah. when you're in the when you're in the grip of lust right and then when i was thinking about it the idea that came to my mind was like it's like when a pot boils over on your stove right yeah all that matters is what's on the what the pot is boiling over everything else is secondary until i deal with this pot Right? It's like when you're in the grip of lust, it's like everything else is secondary until I deal with this. Until this is dealt with, I can't focus on anything else. Mm-hmm. And then when you're done, then you realize what, the mess that is made and what's happened. And then you look at all the other things that you have going on and you're like, oh yeah. And then you, you, re- and then you, and then you realize like, you, you really messed up and you know, you, that that was the illustration that came to my mind when I was thinking on this. Yeah, I mean it's a pretty good analogy because, I mean, like it's, if you, like if you say if you're boiling something with on a pot, right? For your for your analogy, if you watch it and you maintain it, it's not going to boil over. Exactly. Like if you catch yourself, uh, you correct take corrective action and stuff like that, it's not going to boil over. But when you start to let go, and you start to be lazy, in your discipline then it's going to boil over and then you're going to have to deal with the consequences. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think it was a good analogy. Thank you for watching this week's episode of Men After God. Join us next week where we go through Disciplines of a Godly Man, Chapter 3, The Discipline of Marriage. <laughs>